So without further ado, I'll turn it over to our speaker, uh, Katie McHugh, and she's presenting on the dolphins of Sarasota Bay, lessons from 50 years of research and conservation. A little bit about Katie is that she began studying wild dolphins um, as an intern in 2000 and spent time studying abroad, or excuse me, studying spotted and dusky dolphins in the Bahamas and New Zealand before returning um, to be a graduate student research in 2004, where she studied juvenile dolphin behavior and the impacts of harmful algal blooms on dolphins in Sarasota Bay. Since completing her dissertation in 2010, Katie has remained with the program working primarily on research aims at understanding and mitigating adverse human dolphin interactions, as well as overseeing behavioral research and coordinating training programs for students and international research researchers. All right, thank you so much for joining us today, Katie. We really appreciate it. And we are all super excited to learn more about the dolphins. All right, well, thank you um, for inviting me. And uh, let me just get this presentation shared here so you can see my screen. All right, can you guys see that? I think it's loading. There's a, oh, there we go. Okay, all right, so um, thanks. As, as uh, you mentioned, I'm uh, Katie McHugh and I'm part of the Chicago Zoological Society's Sarasota Dolphin Research Program. Um, and if, for those who aren't familiar with us, which might be many of you on the East Coast, um, we are the world's longest running study of a wild dolphin population. We're a long-term collaboration between CZS and Moat Marine Laboratory and based in Sarasota, Florida. Um, and you can find out lots about our program at our website, um, sarasotadolphin.org. Um, and just to kind of set the stage here and introduce you to a couple of our dolphins here. So, um, and on the environment that we work in, it's actually similar to the IRL on the other coast, but we have lots of shallow water bays and estuaries. This here is our oldest dolphin in Sarasota Bay. Um, she's FB54 and her four-year-old daughter. And um, Randy chose this clip to kind of introduce you to our animals. I'll let it play one more time. Because uh, FB54 is the same age as our program. So we just celebrated our 50th anniversary in October. So we're in our 50th year of doing research, education, and conservation related to bottlenose dolphins. Um, the work that I'm going to present today is <laughs> the work of a lot of people, so not just myself. Um, and certainly um, many people have been involved with this program over the decades. Um, our current research team, there's about um, uh, 12 of us on staff and we're um, led by our fearless leader down here, Dr. Randy Wells. If you've heard of anyone from our program, it is probably him. He's dolphin man himself. And he has been part of the program since its beginning in 1970 when he was a high school intern. So I've been part of the program since 2000 when I came as a college intern, been here for about 20 years of the program, but um, certainly there's much that was built before me and much of the information I'll present today is, is work that, that other people have done. Um, the photo in the middle here is one that we like to start with because this picture kind of culminates for Randy everything that we've been able to learn by, by following our research approach over the decades. So this picture was taken a few years back and several of these animals aren't even with us anymore. But in this one picture right out in Randy's backyard, he saw Nicklo. At the time, she was 62 years old, and she is the oldest dolphin we've ever documented, the oldest bald-nosed dolphin documented anywhere in the world. Her best buddy, Black Tip Double Dip, who is um, maybe one of Randy's favorites because they share a birthday. Um, and then Nicklo's daughter, Eve, who was the mother of this little guy in the middle, um, F-286, who at the time was a super spanking newborn and sort of the oldest and youngest members of our community together, animals of known ages and maternal lineages and histories and relationships and relationships to our coastal environment. And so this picture kind of was a culmination for him of, of a lot of what we've learned and I'll share many of those things with you guys today. So what is my goal here? Um, hopefully in about you know 45 minutes or so, maybe a little less if I go quickly, um, I'll introduce you to what our program's about, what we do and how we do it, what we've learned about bottlenose dolphins and some other species. 
um, and how this has been applied to dolphin conservation. And then importantly, how you can help dolphins because we're a research team. There's a lot of us involved, but really what it comes down to are dolphin interactions with members of the public and people who they encounter in their everyday lives. Um, but I'd be remiss to go any further without thanking many people, including a lot of our current funders who've made this work possible over the last 50 years. Um, we owe a huge debt of gratitude to individual donors as well as many organizations that have made our work possible. All right, so what's our basic approach? There's a lot on this slide. It's a slide I borrowed from Randy, but it really also kind of encapsulates the what we do of how we do our work. So our overall approach is longitudinal monitoring of the biology, behavior, health, ecology of individual dolphins and their ecosystems. And we're able to accomplish this by working in what has become a unique natural laboratory in Sarasota Bay, where the initial discovery that dolphins remain resident to our bay over long time periods and throughout the year really led to the buildup of a, a very collaborative, large scale and comprehensive research program for dolphin research and population monitoring, where we get to know the animals and all the aspects of their biology well over their lifetimes. So some of the backbone pieces of this include monthly photo photographic identification surveys, periodic health assessments on the dolphins, getting an ecological perspective by assessing the abundance and, um, and distribution of important prey fish, um, more detailed sampling, including biopsy dart sampling and focal follows of individuals, as well as listening in with passive acoustic stations to the sounds that we're able to hear in their environment. And I'll talk a little bit more about each of these as we go, but, but Solving sort of the puzzle of dolphin lives has really meant a large variety of research activities over a number of years and with many, many collaborators. Our main study site since 1970 has been Central West Florida. So we're based at Moat Marine Laboratory, which is here on City Island in Sarasota Bay. But we've done focused work in the Gulf of Mexico, Tampa Bay to the north, Charlotte Harbor to the south, and even increasingly further south towards the Naples area. Here, we know our animals extremely well. And this compilation are just an example of 50 of the individuals that we've gotten to know over 50 years. This is one animal that was born in each year of our program from 1970 through 2019. Um, and you can get a sense for them as individuals a little bit in this picture. And I'll, I'll share a bit more about what we've learned about them um, as we go forward. But you might be thinking, why do I you know, care about what you guys do in Sarasota if I'm over here in the IRL? Well, we, a lot of what we dolphins has been applied elsewhere, and we also do collaborate with folks throughout the Gulf of Mexico and southeastern United States. Um, we are uh, frequently involved in research primarily on the Gulf side, but also on the East Coast, including rescues of animals, tagging and tracking studies, health assessments of dolphins, and, um, and other activities. Um, and so our work does uh, apply and we do um, work with folks um, throughout the region. In addition, what we've learned about dolphins and the techniques that we've developed and practiced and been able to kind of hone in Sarasota Bay have also helped us to benefit dolphins and porpoises around the world. So our staff are often called upon, especially Randy um, Wells, to consult or collaborate on um, conservation projects related to uh, a wide variety of um, other species around the world that are facing pressing issues, you know, species like the vaquita in the Gulf of California or the Franciscana dolphin in South America. Um, and in addition, we also provide a lot of training opportunities for international researchers and colleagues who want to learn how to study these animals and how to you know, safely uh, care for them and do other things that they might need to do back in their um, home environments. And so one of the things that I'm most um, you know, proud about in addition to what we know about dolphins in Sarasota is the way that we've been able to apply what we've learned and the techniques that have been developed directly towards conservation of species that are really facing some, some major issues um, around the world. So our approach, like I said, we kind of study everything you can think of about dolphins in Sarasota, and we've learned a lot through this longitudinal monitoring of individual dolphins in their ecosystem. Our research kind of fits into four broad categories. The first is ecology or interactions between dolphins and other species in their, in their environment, as well as population structure and dynamics or interactions between 
different neighboring sort of dolphin communities, how dolphin populations are organized up and down the coast. We also study social structure, behavior, and communication. So how individuals within a dolphin community interact with each other, what's affecting their behavior, and how they um, manage those social relationships and a lot of their um, interactions with their environment using uh, primarily acoustic communication. We study dolphin health and physiology. And um, importantly, even where our animals are doing relatively well, we still can't avoid human interactions and impacts. And so we do a lot of work focused on those types of questions as well. How do we do what we do? Well, our primary research technique is photographic identification. So we're able to tell individual dolphins apart from patterns of nicks and notches on their dorsal fin. And this helps us compile individual records from these animals from birth all the way through to their death and confirm their identity over time. So we go out on boats and we take lots of pictures. Um, through these techniques on our part of the coast of Florida, we've identified over 5,500 individuals over the last 50 years. And some of these animals have been seen over 1,500 times. So we get to know them extremely well over the course of their life. This is just one example. This is Bobbit. She's kind of like my, maybe my spirit dolphin of, of the bunch because um, she was a one-year-old my first year of the program. So she was an itty bitty calf swimming around with her mom when I came to Sarah's first time as an intern. And at that time I was helping some graduate students that were looking at things like how um, moms care for infants and how infant um, communication develops. Um, we were also starting to look at some um, uh, preliminary data on how uh, boat noise was affecting dolphin communication. And her mom was one of the focal animals for those studies. And so she was one of the calves I first learned. When we came back, as I came back as a grad student in 2004, she was off on her own, no longer with her mom. And all she had, if I don't know if you can see my little cursor here, as a uh, identifying feature, I guess, was this notch up here. And I said that we can tell them apart by nicks and notches, but there was another dolphin in our study area that looked a lot like her. And she was also one of the dolphins I was following around because they were these juveniles in our population. And they looked so, so, I always had to get an excellent picture and find the tiny notches that differed between them, like this one here and some of the ones down here. The second season of my, of my graduate work, I came back and this is what her friend looked like. In her case, it turns out that all of this um, was the result of a thankfully unsuccessful shark predation attempt. So she had suffered a pretty severe shark bite injury that also took a significant portion of her fluke and had left her fin quite distinctive. She's now one of the more distinctive animals in our population. Um, and now she, like myself, is quite a bit older and is a mother herself. And so she's a dolphin that, that I always sort of feel a little kind of lift when I see her out on, on, on the boat and I see her out in the in the in the community. She's one that I sort of you know think about she's grown up with the program kind of as I have. Anyhow, but she's one of many individuals that we know. And in addition to helping us identify these animals, photo ID really helps us understand dolphin lives. So FB54, that 50 year old dolphin I showed you in the video at the beginning, um, she's been seen uh, I think over 1200 times by our program. And this is a snapshot of all of her sightings from 1975 through March, through about a year ago of 2020 in Sarasota Bay. And you can see that she uses quite a bit of the range, but she tends to focus on this northern part. Um, for those of you unfamiliar with this part of the coast, this is Anna Maria Island here in South Tampa Bay. So she really favors some of these inshore waters just inside Anna Maria Island. We're able to really learn about where they go, how they spend their lives, what they're doing um, when they're in those areas. These photographs also help us understand a bit about their health status. So in this case, if an animal has skin lesions or other issues, the reproductive success. So if an animal's having calves, we're able to track those calves and, and their survivorship using these photos. Also their social structure. So who they're in groups with and how they're interacting over time. And importantly for conservation, we also really rely upon photographs in our follow-up monitoring of animals that might get injured. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about rescues and interventions later, but um, photos are really how we first assess, you know, how severe an injury is and how it's progressing with an animal. And then also after we might do a rescue, we use those photographs to make sure that the animals are really healing and, and thriving. 
In addition to photo ID, we do occasional um, capture release health assessments um, to sort of complement these other methods and get a real, you know, um, um, physical assessment of health and body condition on these animals. We can collect samples for analysis of contaminant and biotoxin levels, better understand life history and even hearing. So up here you can see we this dolphin with all these uh, suction cup stuck to it is actually having its hearing tested in the same way that we test hearing of, of infants. So here's one of our former um, lab managers' kids getting their, their um, hearing tested when they were an infant. But basically, we play sounds to the animals while recording um, the activity from the, um, the auditory uh, portion of the brain. So you can tell if the animals are actually hearing um, any tones that are played to them. Increasingly, we use, this isn't the best picture of it, sorry, but ultrasound techniques to really get a, a, a comprehensive view of the, the health of internal organs as well. Um, so we're able to get a, pretty much a, a full physical workup on some animals and provide a mechanism to better understand their health. Um, we also study dolphins in their, in their ecology and in their ecosystem. So we spend quite a bit of time doing long-term monitoring of dolphin prey as well as of dolphins. And these prey and feeding studies provide really an ecological perspective for understanding dolphin lives. And we do this in a number of ways. We, we watch dolphins and we see what they're catching. We can use uh, overhead imaging. We used to use this fun blimp that was tethered behind our boat. Um, to get an overhead perspective on how animals were feeding and, and using different habitats. Now we can update this with, with drone technology. And we go out and we actually catch and assess the abundance of important um, prey fish, as well as looking at what dolphins are eating when their carcasses are recovered and they come in for necropsy, we can look at stomach content so that we understand which components of the local ecosystem are, are most important for the animals in terms of their prey resources. And over you know, all these techniques and, and more, we've learned some really important things. So observing dolphins all year round for decades and tracking individuals from birth through death has really taught us a lot about bottlenose dolphin biology. And what we found on our coast does also apply to the animals that you would see on the East Coast in a place like the IRL or other places. So first, we've really documented very long lifespans with year-round residency to local waters. This is um, a facet that was discovered in Sarasota Bay, but is found to be sort of a common theme up and down the coast. These animals live in multiple sort of um, concurrent generations. So they live generation after generation in the same place in a mosaic of what we call communities along Florida's coast. They're not closed populations because the animals from say Sarasota Bay do interbreed with animals from the Gulf of Mexico or Tampa Bay, but they spend most of their time with the other individuals that live in the same place that they do and their kids and grandkids and great grandkids and so on do as well. These communities are um, really um, uh, have very complex social structure and communication and I'll show you a couple examples. And then our impacts can put these animals at risk. So they really do need our help to continue sharing our coastal environment for decades to come. So um, some uh, basics here about things that we have learned. So we have these multi-decadal, multi-generational communities. In Sarasota Bay, our community is about 170 bottlenose dolphins. We've documented these dolphins across six generations with up to five concurrent generations present at the same time. They live here for a long time periods. And this lady who you saw earlier, Nick Lowe, I already sort of uh, gave you the spoiler, but she's the oldest known bottlenose dolphin in the world. When she was last in our community, she was 67 years old. And we found males that can live up to 52 years. So they have very long lives spent along our changing coasts. Perhaps the most important discovery of our program is that these animals really have long-term residency to our bay and estuaries. So the coast is their really long-term multi-generational home. And this is one example of, I think this, this might've been the first documented five generation lineage in Sarasota Bay. And each color here represents the sightings of a different individual from the great great grandmother all the way down to the 2007 calf in this case. You can see how all five generations use these same community waters. This map will probably look a little bit familiar to you from the FB54 map before, but different individuals favor different, you know, sub areas within our broader community range. And this isn't something that's only been found in Sarasota. It is also seen in Tampa Bay and all throughout the Gulf of Mexico, as well as on the east coast of Florida in estuaries. 
Um, so this really set the stage for most of our future research and has become the basis for inshore bottlenose dolphin management. It's based on these individual sort of overlapping mosaic of communities that are resident over the long term to each sort of bay or estuary system. Um, dolphins live in very complex societies. So our long-term study has really helped us define life history, reproductive and social parameters for bottlenose dolphins, um, at least in this part of the world. Um, their societies are what are called fission fusion societies. Um, and that's kind of a fancy way of saying that dolphins interact in small groups and the members of those groups change composition frequently. So it's kind of like people. We might be with one group of you know, individuals, our family at home having breakfast in the morning and then we'll go to work or school and interact with other um, people and then we might come back to our family at night. Um, so who they're interacting with is context dependent and also depends a bit on whether or not they have current um, offspring. We found that most often calves spend the first three to six years of lives with their mother, so they have very prolonged maternal care. During this time, they tend to be found in nursery groups with other moms and calves of similar ages. Um, we have found that individuals as young as one and a half years old can survive if orphaned. Um, it's rare, but it has happened in our coast. So they're able to catch food when they're younger than three to six years and able to potentially even survive, but they're learning other things from their mom as well as, you know, learning about their environment and their, their social and ecological environment um, during this long period of dependency. After they leave their moms, they spend the next two to 10 years in these very fluid and active mixed sex groups with other juveniles where they're kind of working out how to live their life as a bottlenose dolphin, who their, um, their closest um, friends might be moving forward. Um, and in particularly for the males, really doing a whole lot of exploring their social and um, and physical environment, um, because when they become adults, the males do something that's really quite unique among the animal kingdom. Um, we've learned first in Sarasota Bay, and then there have been many other places where it's been confirmed and even, even taken place in, in a more complex way, that adult male bottlenose dolphins form very, very close alliances. They form these alliances in Sarasota with usually only one other dolphin. That's not always true around the world, but here we have typically pairs of dolphins they act kind of like wingmen. They form a very tight bond and they, they spend almost all of their time together until one of them you know, passes away or, or goes missing. Um, and they, they are usually forming these alliances with, with animals that they are familiar with. So cohort mates or age mates, not with relatives say, like you might see in something like lion prides. Um, the females don't form these tight alliances, but they, um, they, they reach sexual maturity a bit earlier <laughs> in addition to living longer. So the females have a bit different life history um, pattern than the males, but they tend to associate primarily with other adult females based on their reproductive status. So if they have calves or hanging out with other females that they're familiar with that also have calves at the same time, which makes sense because that affords some predator and other protection benefits as well as um, some help with you know, shared say, care of offspring, if you will when they're, they're needing to feed and things. And these complex communities are really um, supported by complex acoustic communication. And so if you think about the underwater environment, sound travels much farther than any other sense, much farther than you can see, or you know, say of course, touch or anything else. And so sound is really important for bottlenose dolphins. And we um, have been studying their communication since the very beginning using a variety of techniques including focal animal observations where, you know, we drive around on a boat and we, we record with a hydrophone in the water, everything that we can hear while the animals are, you know, living their lives. We also, during our periodic health assessments, were able to get individual recordings. So this in the middle here is a um, suction cup hydrophone that we stick to the melon of the dolphin. <clears throat> With dolphin anatomy where their actual vocalizations come out is through a fatty organ in the forehead called the melon. It sort of directs and focuses sound. And so if we wanna record something and know that it's coming from a specific dolphin, we can stick a hydrophone right there and record all the whistles that those animals are making. In that controlled setting, we're also able to play back recordings to animals and look at their responses to understand what sort of information content and what context these different vocalizations might be important in. And these techniques are how we really learn one of the most famous things about dolphin communication, which is that 
they have individually distinctive whistles, which we call signature whistles. And I'll play an example for you in a minute. A cool technique that we're starting to use a bit more often, but um, still only in the context when we're able to put our hands on the animals to attach the instruments are these D tags or digital, digital acoustic tags. These are really cool um, kind of onboard computers that stick with suction cups again to the animals and they will stay on for up to 24 hours and record all the sounds the animals make and hear as well as their fine scale behavior. And if I can get it to work, I'll play a video here in a second. So here are those signature whistles that I was talking about. Um, in this exchange, this example, you're going to hear an exchange of whistles from a mom and a calf. And this graph, which you'll see a couple that look like this, is called a spectrogram. So this is frequency on the y-axis or the pitch of the sound and time on the x-axis. And then the brightness of the color is how intense the sound is. So you can kind of see what the whistle is going to look like. And this is a mom and a calf who are recorded calling back and forth to each other with these just distinct whistles. So let's see. So that top one, the sort of tweet, tweet, tweet is the mom. And then the new down sweep is the calf. And they're kind of saying, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. And this is a way that they maintain contact. <clears throat> in this case, in a health assessment setting, but this is also something that they use particularly in the wild when uh, groups are joining and separating in that really dynamic um, social engagement that we see. In addition, they make these very high intensity sounds called burst pulse sounds. These ones were recorded uh, from a D tag from an adult male. And these are quite a bit different. They're very broadband and loud. So hopefully this one, if you couldn't hear the other one, you will hear them. So these kinds of sounds we found are used most often during high energy social interactions. In this case, this male and his alliance partner were um, just encountering a potentially receptive female and they were kind of moving in to try to escort her around for a potential reproductive consortship. And then here is the other sounds that you probably are familiar with dolphins making, in this case, echolocation. These tend to be more like clicks. They're broadband clicks and buzzes that are used for navigation and feeding. And so here you'll hear from the same dolphin recorded on a D-tag, the same adult male. He'll be clicking and then have a focused beam of echolocation, which is likely where he's honing in on something like a fish. So those echolocation clicks, oh, here's where I'll try to show, we have time, yeah, to show you this video, um, are, are really the sort of the dolphin's version of sonar, if you will, and um, that's how they are able to kind of navigate and also um, uh, hone in on prey at the last minute. So let me try to share a different screen here for a second, see if I can get this to work, because this video you're going to see a shot from the air. So this is us using drone footage and you'll hear audio from a D tag. So recording the sounds the dolphins are make as they're actually going about trying to catch fish. So they're going to be using a technique called fish whacking here. Hopefully you'll be able to hear this. So this is FB54 again, that same dolphin. She's, I'm pointing with my finger like you can see it. She's this dolphin here on the right and her calf is on the left. They both have those little onboard computers that you can see just in front of their dorsal fin. And there's, that's an echolocation buzz. And then she just tried to whack around and hit some of those mullet that were in front of her with her didn't make contact this time. And now she's swimming up to kind of do it again. So that time it's a little small, but you can see the fish go flying through the surface and then she makes a nice little kind of uh, buzz as she's going to um, as she's going to catch it at the end. So you get to kind of hear all of those things. All right. Um, and so this brings me to the other kinds of sounds that are very important for dolphins in their environment, and those are the sounds of their food. So we have found through our long-term studies of dolphins and their prey, that dolphins eat a wide variety of fish, but they select for and they target sound producing or soniferous fish um, 
um, much more frequently relative to their actual abundance in the, in the marine ecosystem. And they spend most of their time swimming around listening. They don't spend most of their time swimming around, you know, buzzing and looking for fish. They're listening for fish. And so um, the details of this table aren't important, but these are some of the top prey species that the dolphins in our coast target. Um, the green star here is a toadfish, and the red one here is a spotted sea trout, and these are the sounds that they make. So that they're going to be low. Hopefully you can hear them. So this is a toadfish. And this one is a spotted sea trout. So that might not sound like much to you. Oh, this but let me stop. Do you have a buzzing for you too? Let me stop and then reshare. Sorry. You didn't happens. have any buzzing on my side. Okay, perfect. Great. Then I'll, I won't worry about it. <laughs> um, yeah, sometimes it like lingers after for me. I don't know why. Um, so that might not sound like much, but to a dolphin, that sounds like dinner. And the one thing I want you to think about is how low and quiet some of those sounds are. What that means is that it's very easy for us to inadvertently disrupt or disturb dolphins when they're feeding when we do things like drive by with our boat engines that also are at similar frequencies. So one thing that we're increasingly doing um, in Sarasota Bay, and we haven't quite expanded this to the East Coast, but there are some others that do similar work over there, is really think about monitoring not just for dolphins, but also their prey and, and for human activity, by really listening in on the underwater soundscape. So we are developing a network of what we call PALS or passive acoustic listening stations that we use primarily for dolphin detection and also to study acoustic ecology and anthropogenic noise. Right now we have, I think 10 stations in, our 11th will be going in soon on Anna Maria Island. They're small, they can be solar powered, they can kind of go anywhere. Um, this picture shows us installing our second one and it's very hard, very small to see, but there's like a dolphin swimming right by this canal, like while we're installing the station. So we're like, felt really good about picking that location for one of our, um, one of our stations. But they help us detect not only dolphins by hearing their whistles, but also changes in things like, um, the soundscape. And in particular, we've used these stations in the last couple of years to look at changes associated with red tides. So red tides are something that I'm sure you folks are familiar with over in the IRL as well as here on the West Coast. It is a problem that we deal with in Florida periodically. And we were actually able to detect almost in real time some of the impacts of the 2018 uh, to 2019 red tide that was quite um, intense on our coast using these techniques. So the first clip I'm going to play for you here is this Cortez station, a station right up in Cortez, Florida. It's the one that that picture happened to be from. And this is um, typical background noise there. This is from August 1st, 2018. See if I can get this to play. It's kind of, oops. It's right next to where my zoom window is. Maybe a little quiet, but you can hear popping, sort of popcorn sound in the background, that snapping shrimp. And then there's a dolphin going by, and then there's even some toadfish. Now, this one, you won't probably hear anything. And that's not a mistake. It just was pretty much silent. So this was one month later at the same site. There is a lonely toadfish periodically calling in this that's really hard to hear because it's very low. Um, and this is after a red tide moved into the area, pretty much killed most of the fish and anything that could move moved out of the area. And then about uh, seven months after the red tide had fully left the area, so the, the next year in August of 2019, this is what the sound was like in that same area. So um, I don't think this one's actually playing, but, but there, you know, there's a little bit of snapping shrimp in the background and you can start to see that things are coming back, but it takes quite a while we found for our, our bay ecosystem to recover after red tide. We've also been able to even match individual dolphins and their signature whistles using these techniques. So we're really excited about their potential into the future. And we, um, we, I have to spend the last few minutes here, sadly, sorry, talking about some of the problems that can happen um, with dolphins. So if you think about dolphins living their lives along our coast, spending many decades here, um, it's pretty easy if you've also been a long-time resident of our coast to think about just how much those neighborhoods change and how much they may have changed over the lifetime of an individual dolphin. So since our research program started in the two counties that our primary study area uh, focuses on, we now have um, three and a half times the number of people and four times the number of boats as there were when our program began in 1970. 
you know, whole islands. If you've ever been to Sarasota, this is Bird Key in 1950, still a spoil island with seagrass all around it. And now, you know, is a, is a very built up area with, with um, lots of homes. The coast is built up quite a bit in, in many ways and the coastal environment has changed a lot, but those dolphins have stayed and remained and dealt with those changes as best they could. Um, we know that they deal with these changes in ways that can potentially impact them. And, and I don't wanna to spend too much time on this, but, but some recent observations in Sarasota, we, including that continuous sound record have found that boats or noise were pretty much always present <laughs> during the day in the detection range of our stations. And that in a particularly high um, uh, boat traffic area, we have boats within dolphins, within hundred meters of our dolphins every two minutes on average, within 50 meters every five minutes on average during daylight hours. These boats are actually stopping to view and observe the animals every 15 minutes and often more than one boat is present. And only about half of these boaters are following the law or following proper viewing guidelines that can help minimize disturbance to these animals. So if you think about what happens every time a boat goes by a dolphin that's living its life in our coastal environment, well, not only do they maybe have to adjust their behavior or their swimming speed or direction to avoid a collision, but they also are going to have a hard time hearing. And this slide was put together by a colleague of mine, Franz Jensen, with recordings of, of dolphins whistling from D-tags and then what can happen with um, boat noise as it comes by to mask those whistles. It really makes it hard to hear. So play this. There's dolphin whistles. Here's the boat in the background on it. Oops. Sorry, that stopped for some reason. I don't know about you guys, but even to me, like that's really loud and quite, quite disruptive. And so if you think about a boat going by every couple minutes on average in the hearing range of these animals, that can be pretty disruptive to their day, even if they just have to call louder or more frequently, which we found they sometimes do to make sure they can hear each other, or they might lose track of that fish that they've been listening for about ready to catch. So for this and other reasons, we, we really like to emphasize with boaters that we keep our distance and we move slowly um, so that we aren't creating as much disturbance with boats. And this is all because dolphins, this is sort of like the slide of doom, this is what Randy slides, Gulf dolphins, as well as dolphins on the east coast of Florida, they face a number of concurrent and cumulative threats. And we try to understand and mitigate all of these things, but the dolphins don't get to choose what threat they're gonna face in any given moment or any given day. So whether there's a red tide around or whether there are predators or whether there are storms or fishing gear or other things that might be a problem, those are all coming at them at the same time. And so we need to do our best to try to work to understand what's causing animals to be injured or perhaps killed and work to mitigate those things that have to do with us. So the last sort of piece of our puzzle of our work is we work very closely with local stranding investigations programs and the stranding network. We're lucky that we have a stranding program right at Moat, which is our home base as well. Um, they can help recover animals or respond when animals get injured. And we found through those collaborations that about, you know, 50% of the animals that come in, they die from natural causes, but about 25% are for things like recreational gear entanglement, boat strikes, recreational gear ingestion, human related injuries that we want to try to prevent. And in particular, before I open it up for questions, I wanna highlight one area that is increasing concern around the Florida, not just on the Gulf Coast, but all around. Um, there are hot spots of entanglement um, for dolphins as well as manatees and sea turtles, both on our coast and on the East Coast of Florida. And in particular, we tend to see on our coast, at least increases in problems with dolphin and fishing interactions in the wakes of things like red tides that impact a lot of their natural prey. They, the animals here will seek alternate sources of food and then they will teach others that they can get food in this way. And anytime a dolphin gets rewarded with food from people, it's going to alter its behavior in ways that can put it in danger and really be frustrating to anglers as well. So we see a variety of related behaviors. We see dolphins patrolling or stalking kind of fishing um, uh, fishermen, both from boats and piers, approaching bait and cat when it's on the line. 
scavenging or stealing fish that are either thrown back or that are even caught on a line and potentially even progressing to the point where they're begging for food from people or people are actively feeding them, um, both of which are very abnormal and very illegal and harmful. And these are problems, not just for you know, people who are fishing who might have gear or catch or bait that gets damaged by dolphins, but also for the dolphins, it presents a really um, high potential risk of injury. And we have found that in Sarasota Bay, um, these types of interactions are increasing over time. The numbers of individuals that are engaging in these risky in, uh, interactions are, engage, are increasing over time and whole families and whole lineages have been impacted. So, so those kids stay with their mom a long time. Well, they learn other things from her, but one of the really key things they learn from mom is where and how to catch food. And if their mom is an animal that has takes food from people sometimes, then the calves will learn the same thing. This is kind of our poster child for this problem on the West Coast. Her name is Vespa or FB79. And in her case, almost all of her kids have been observed also engaging in unnatural foraging behaviors around recreational fishing, and several of them have died as a result of human-related injuries. So our goal is to try to prevent these injuries in the first place, but we can respond when animals get injured with help and um, saving one animal over time really can add up. These are a number of rescues that we've done on the west coast of Florida where animals have gotten entangled in primarily fishing gear, but they can get entangled in any kind of debris in the marine environment. This one here was entangled in a men's Speedo swimsuit. This one was entangled in a packing strap. And I know, I think maybe on either in the panhandle or on the east coast, I forget where there was a dolphin entangled in you know an aerobie frisbee, like those open frisbees. If they can swim through it, it can get stuck on them. And we, we, we fortunately can respond sometimes if public um, reports come in, they let us rescue animals. We've learned that on our coast, at least these rescues over time can really add up. And this is another picture that was taken by Randy um, or his wife when they were out around Christmas time in, in 2017. And he realized as he's taking the picture that, that this large group of moms and calves were there and three of the four moms wouldn't have been alive without the interventions or rescues that we're able to do. And none of their calves would have ever been able to live. So we, you know, we kind of saw that and we thought about, well, can we analyze how this might be um, benefiting not just these individuals, but whole populations if we're able to intervene and rescue when animals get into trouble before they strand. And in this case, all these animals were disentangled prior to getting so badly injured that they, you know, stranded and stopped swimming. And so we worked with our collaborators all up and down the coast from um, Pinellas County all the way down through Naples, Florida. And we looked at the long-term consequences of, um, or the long-term success of rescues. And we're able to find that we actually had measurable population benefits. So this is the population trajectory with rescues in blue and without rescues in red. And we can actually see a population level difference in terms of more animals being able to survive because of our rescues. And so we are able to help, but we're only, like I said, a small research team. So what dolphins really need is you and everybody in our state to really help do the things that can help support their conservation. And if you remember nothing else from this long talk of me rambling at you, please remember these three things. Don't feed wildlife. <laughs> the number one thing you can do to help dolphins is just let them live their lives and be wild dolphins. Don't feed wildlife. It's harmful and it's illegal to feed wild dolphins. The second is to give animals their space. It's recommended to view dolphins from at least 50 yards or half a football field, to give them room to breathe, feed, and play, give your boat a distance away to not really be getting in their way of movement or behavior, and also to potentially slow down if you're in a place where you can't see them well or know what they're doing. And then lastly, to stash your trash. As I mentioned, dolphins get entangled primarily in recreational fishing gear, but in many other things as well. So recycle or discard fishing gear and trash properly because these items can kill or injure dolphins and other wildlife. And it really is uh, uh, the case that, that you can help, right? Like you can help keep dolphins safe by following responsible viewing guidelines. I'm not gonna go through all these. The most important one is keeping your distance and not trying to pursue an animal that is clearly trying to get away from you, right? If you stop a distance away, put your engine in neutral or move really slowly, the animals will get to keep doing what they're doing. You'll get to see much cooler behavior than if you're just chasing an animal around. 
You can also help prevent injuries by following a number of tips that we have. And if you know of locations where there's lots of problems with dolphins and fishing interactions, and you would like us to try to provide some um, outreach materials, we have lots of them to share. So please feel free to get in touch with me. But the most important things are not to feed animals, to reel in your line if dolphins come and approach you and, and not cast or throw or release um, you know, bait or catch or, or throwbacks right next to dolphins that makes it easy for them to get. Um, those are the sort of the key things. And also you can help prevent marine debris impacts. So we have everything from encouraging you to recycle your fishing line through um, official programs for that that are all throughout the state. Um, but also when you're on the water, please pick up any trash that you see, or if you're anywhere near, you know, um, uh, creeks or stormwater or other places on shore that the debris could get into the marine environment, please make sure that you help clean it up. Um, if you're interested, you can join our virtual debris team on Marine Debris Tracker app, which is a fun app that lets you actually record where and what you're picking up when you're when you're helping to clean up the environment. We use it to track the trash that we pick up in the course of our research activities, as well as organize cleanup events. And then lastly, and really importantly, you can help report when you see animals in trouble. And so I mentioned our rescues and I mentioned our collaboration with the Stranding Network. All of that work is entirely thanks to public reports, to people who are on the water or near the water, see something of concern and call it in. So anywhere in Florida, the main number to call is FWC. There's a hotline 888-404-FWCC. That you have to kind of go through some menus, but it'll take you to a place where you can report information. If you tend to spend time outside of the state of Florida, anywhere in the Southeast US, the um, Southeast Regional Stranding Network hotline is 1-877-WHALE-HELP. And if you don't like making phone calls right away or you don't feel like storing these numbers in your phone, but you like apps, there's also an app called Dolphin and Whale 911 that is available only for um, Apple right now. It's not available on Android, but it will connect you to the proper um, stranding network responders anywhere in the United States or territories. Um, if you enable location services, it will directly connect you to report and also give you tips on what you should and shouldn't do with animals, depending on if they're alive or dead. So anyway, with that, I will stop <laughs> rambling at you. Sorry, I went a little bit longer than I intended, but I just wanna say thank you for your attention and thank you for your interest in these animals. Um, you know, responsible interactions with them really help protect them and people being interested and engaged is awesome. And we would never tell people not to watch animals in the marine environment just to give them some space and let them live their lives. So here's my email address if you guys wanna get in touch with me about any questions I can't answer during Q&A, but otherwise I'm ready to try. Let's see, what do you got? Yeah. Awesome, Katie, that was a fantastic presentation. I really enjoyed learning everything that you all do and it was very fascinating. I have a few questions, but I won't ask them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so a couple of quick ones. Um, can we hear the vocalizations um, of the dolphins or can you only hear it when they're underwater? You can hear it sometimes. So um, so a lot of the vocalization is in our hearing range. Some of it is above our hearing range or harmonic. Um, it's easiest to hear it if you're underwater or if you have a hydrophone. However, if a dolphin swims close to your boat, like I will frequently when we're doing our photo ID work, be able to hear them whistling from the surface, you know, underwater near the boat. So it is possible to hear, yeah. Awesome. Um, what is the difference between dolphins and porpoises? Oh, there's a number of differences between dolphins and porpoises. So they are they are different species, and um, well, there's many different species of both porpoises and dolphins. Um, a couple of the things, like one of the the most telling things, are the shape of their teeth. So dolphins have conical teeth, and um, porpoises tend to have what we call spade shaped teeth. But there is a number of other morphological differences as well. But but um, porpoises and and bottlenose dolphins they do um, depending on the species we're talking about overlap frequently in their say habitats and their ranges. Um, but they they also have a number of differences. Awesome, thank you. That was that was a great answer. Um, okay, so. All right, so I think we addressed this one already in the presentation, but I just wanted to double check. Um, what different species of dolphins are found in Sarasota Bay? Do these dolphins migrate? And if so, how far do they travel? Yeah, that, sorry, that is a great question. I never fully addressed that. Yeah, on, on our coast, 
um, and close to the coast. This would probably be the same on the east coast. The, the only species that we have is bottlenose dolphin, so Triceops truncatus. In the inshore waters, that's the only one that you would see in the state of Florida. Once you get offshore into the Atlantic, of course, or into the Gulf of Mexico, there's a, there's a number of species. And there's actually um, a second app, if you guys are interested in apps. It's called C and ID. Um, and it gives you, you know, all the distinguishing characteristics for the dolphins and whales, as well as manatees, which are pretty obvious, but um, <laughs> that you might see in, in the Southeast US. Um, and so in particular, if you see something that's not a bottlenose dolphin and it's inshore, there's probably something wrong with it. That's what you're that's probably sick or injured or something because they don't tend to come in close to the coast. On our side, the next thing you're gonna get, and this is usually similar on the East Coast, are gonna be spotted dolphins. So you'll see, start to see spotted dolphins as you get a little further offshore. Um, and then, you know, in the Gulf side, we get to spinners and all sorts of other species once you get pretty far offshore. On the East Coast, you guys are lucky. I mean, if you're a little bit further north than you are, but you'll get things like right whales pretty close to the shore, which we don't, we don't see over here. Um, so there's some differences uh, based on the Gulf versus the Atlantic and the Gulf Stream, but awesome. yeah. Thank you. Okay. And they don't, they don't migrate. So sorry, so the bottlenose dolphins that we see inshore, they don't migrate. But the ones offshore and in the Gulf, they do move a bit more widely. So on the East Coast, you guys do have, um, again, starts a bit further north, but you do have what's called a, a coastal migratory population of bottlenose dolphins on the East Coast. And it starts kind of in Northern Florida into the Carolinas. And, and during um, the summer months, it'll go like all the way up towards New England and kind of come back down but the inshore ones are, are pretty resident year round and don't migrate. Oh, huh, very interesting. Okay, let's see. So um, we do have one here. So, um, and this is just kind of um, just like your opinion on it. Um, what would be the impact of the Piney Point tailings pond leaking into Tampa Bay on dolphin populations? That's a really Great question. And I think we don't have enough information yet to really answer that. Um, we actually, I mean, Randy, our research director and, and our field coordinator are on a boat today up that way, just kind of trying to assess what level of monitoring we might attempt to do for dolphins in the area. So it's also still ongoing. Um, and, and there are some certainly, you know, potential ecological concerns with that large of a volume of nutrient, you know, laden water going directly into the bay. Um, so we, it's probably too early to say directly, um, but we're, we're at the beginning stages of trying to, to, to work through what type of monitoring and what type of impacts we'll be looking for. Yeah. Well, we definitely hope for the best, just, you know, or the best outcome as possible with this difficult situation. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, let's see, what do dolphins approach people when they are swimming? Sometimes, I mean, not regularly, at least, you know, we, we tend to see dolphins more or less ignore people um, unless they're an animal that's really become habituated to like, you know, begging for food or something like that. You know, we've had a handful of animals on our coast over the years that have, have been beggars and really approached people mostly on boats for food, not usually swimmers. Um, you hear stories every so often of, you know, sort of what they call these lone sociable dolphins that will kind of swim up and, and approach people. But we don't regularly see that. Typically, they are they might swim close to beaches when they're foraging, and they might swim even around, you know, people who are in the water sometimes, but they don't usually approach them. Got it. Um, so kind of tying into what uh, your answer there, um, one participant submitted that they are, they live on the Indian River Lagoon and dolphins regularly come up to their seawall and will splash them, show them their fish catches, flip, et cetera. Is this normal behavior? I mean, well, feeding along seawalls is normal behavior. So we, that's one, one way, you know, the dolphin, dolphins all around Florida have kind of learned uh, to adapt to our changing coast is that there some animals have learned to use those seawalls as a barrier to herd fish again. So if you have a dolphin that comes and catches fish along your seawall, you probably see this fairly frequently. Um, and that canal where I showed you our listening station is a spot where like we always see dolphins there feeding along that seawall. So like we, we know it's a popular thing. I've definitely seen them chase them along seawalls. I've seen them throw and kick them along seawalls. Even sometimes I've assumed accidentally having them land up on the seawall where they can no longer get them. 
Um, but they're curious animals. And so if you're standing on a seawall and a dolphin's feeding near you and it happens to notice you there, like it wouldn't surprise me if it looked up, you know, but, um, but yeah, tr directly trying to engage with people is maybe not normal, but at the same time, as long as they're not trying to get you to feed them, I wouldn't necessarily call it abnormal either because they're, they're curious about anything they can see in their environment. And they might be using that seawall to, you know, smack the fish up against it. Yes. So, yes. Very mm -hmm. cool. All right, we've got time for a couple more questions. Um, what is the legal distance people should keep from dolphins? And is that a federal regulation? Yes. So, so the federal regulation is the Marine Mammal Protection Act. And under the Marine Mammal Protection Act, is illegal to harass an animal. But what harassment is, is a little bit, I'm gonna get the whole technical definition, more or less anything you do that changes an animal's behavior is legally or technically harassment. So um, the recommended viewing distance, and it is a, a federal um, viewing guideline, is 50 yards. So that 50 yards that I mentioned in the, you know, sorry, you can help slide, that's the recommended viewing distance for bottlenose dolphins. Um, the viewing distances are a bit larger for um, right whales and for some other things. Let me see, let me find the actual numbers so I don't tell you the wrong thing since I'm not used to uh, having to, um, having to do this. Okay, so dolphins is 50 yards, whales is 100 yards, but North Atlantic right whales is 500 yards. So they are highly endangered and we need to give them as much space as possible. So I knew it was higher, but, <laughs> but yeah, dolphins is 50 yards, whales is 100 yards and North Atlantic right whales um, would be 500 yards. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, and if you want any more information about the North Atlantic right whale, uh, we do have that program with the Marine Resources Council, which you can check out online at our website at savetheirl.org. Um, we have time for just one more question. All right, last question. Um, okay. All right. Um, when kayaking and dolphins approach you, how should you respond? Well, when you're kayaking, you at least don't really have the engine um, that could potentially say injure the animals, but kayakers are also subject to the same viewing guidelines and recommendations as motor boats or jet skis or any other vessel. So if a dolphin approaches you, my recommendation is usually to either continue, maintain what you're doing. So if you're just paddling along, just keep going in the same speed and direction that you're going, or to stop paddling and wait, you know, if you're on a, if you're on a motorboat or a jet ski, our recommendation is usually to, to again, again, if you're going slowly, is to put the boat in neutral and let the animal pass. Um, so if you're kayaking, same thing, you could stop, you know, put your paddle up, let the animal go on by. Um, if you're kayak fishing, say, and a dolphin approaches you, then it would be the same recommendations as anyone else who has issues with animals fishing, which would be to reel in your line, same thing, you know, and wait for the animal to move on before you continue fishing or release a fish, um, if at all possible, to not let the animal get any food. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Katie. That was a fantastic presentation. I really enjoyed it. I, uh, I know our participants did as well. Um, if you have any more questions related to the Sarasota Dolphin Research Program, uh, please email Katie at kmchugh at moat.org. Um, or if you have any questions related to our future Lunch and Learn webinars, please email me, Nicole at mrcirl. Oh, excuse me. Yeah. I, mrcirl org. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone. And just a friendly reminder, this presentation is recorded and will be up on our website uh, this afternoon. All right. Well, thank you so much and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.